Hello, and welcome back to another fun-filled episode of The Hammercast. I am your host, Alex, the Hebrew Hammer Salkin. And joining me on today's episode is going to be Jeff Newpert, retired master kettlebell instructor under Pavel Tsatsulin, one of only a few dozen people who have ever achieved that rank. Uh, he's also been a competitive Olympic lifter. He has trained athletes and average folks for decades. An incredibly smart guy. Uh, I was first introduced to his work with his uh, kettlebell, uh, kettlebell muscle is what it was called. I don't believe it's in print anymore, but it's one of the best kettlebell books I've ever read. And I remember reading through it and just being astonished by, by how he could take movements that I already knew and loved and use them to not only build more muscle, but get a lot stronger as well. Very, very intelligent, uh, well, uh, well-versed, well very experienced guy in the world of strength and conditioning. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention this. He's also one half of the dynamic duo that is responsible for bringing us original strength. So if you have taken part in the original strength revolution, you can in large part thank Jeff for all of the hard work that he put in in those early years. Uh, Jeff has been somewhat retired over the last couple of years, and he's kind of been coming out of retirement lately, which I had been hoping for. So I managed to snag an interview with him that I think you're really going to like. It is about training and gaining past the age of 40. And uh, given that he is indeed on the wrong side of 40, he has got a lot of insight into how exactly to do that. Uh, now, we're going to get started with the interview pretty soon. But before we do, I would be remiss if I did not mention this as well. My nine-minute kettlebell and bodyweight challenge has finally been released and is available for your consumption. So I, I would highly recommend checking it out. It's very avant-garde. This is not like the majority of the kettlebell and bodyweight programs that you're going to see out there. This is one that's going to make all of them stronger. In fact, I like to think about it as like the foundation of uh, kettlebell and bodyweight training. And the really interesting thing about it is that it does not contain swings and get-ups, nor does it contain push-ups and pull-ups. It contains movements that I think are actually far more important. And the nice thing is, like I said, it's going to make all these other traditional kettlebell and bodyweight moves much, much stronger. So I won't give you too much more detail, but I will start with that. If you go into the show notes or the description, depending on where you're watching or listening to this, you will see a link that will allow you to uh, get access to the nine-minute kettlebell and bodyweight challenge. I think you're really going to dig it. All right. So now, without further ado, Jeff Newbert. All right, Jeff, welcome to the Hammercast. The Hammercast. Thanks for having me, Alex. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Am pleasure is mine. That? What's that? It's an, what, didn't you do this thing a couple of years ago about it's an honor? Something well, like that. That's why close. I threw there. Very close. It was yeah. uh, humbled and honored. Humbled. I take umbrage with that. Yeah. Um, and I got to tell you, you know, I, don't, I, I, I think that I'm going to have, in the long run, I'll have a bigger impact on the fitness industry than this. But I really do think that like that struck a chord because I noticed not very many people say that anymore because there was a time, it was like before that post, this could totally be, you know, confusing correlation and causation. But before that post, um, I would see that all the time. And for the people who are listening, who are, have mercifully been spared from this ridiculous <laughs> and overly repeated phrase, basically what it was was like any fitness professional. Yeah, any fitness professional would be like uh, assisted at a workshop you know, I was humbled and honored to blah, blah, blah. Or, you know, like uh, had a chance to sit down with, uh, you know, guru number one, two, three, and, you know, was humbled and honored. And it's like, I, do you know what those words mean? Because I, I don't, I, I just don't think you're using them correctly. And so I, I made a, I made a post about it. And then I swear to you, like, I've seen it maybe once or twice since then. People have really cut back. Yeah, I think it was a pretty good post. It was a couple of years ago now, but I, you had some good comments on that. Yes, I'm, it was. an honor to read this post. Yeah, I, of course, people were like, oh, I'm humbled and honored that you made this, <laughs> that you wrote this. This is always some joker, you know, jumping in. This is, you know, periodically, I like to throw in like kind of a comedic rant. Like, I, you know, I never really vent on Facebook, but I might say something like, I don't know. I thought, I think once I said like, everybody you can stop calling everything that you like beautiful you're just ruining the word it was something like that and people are like this is a beautiful post or like what a beautiful <laughs> you know whatever Very beautiful sentiments yeah e exactly exactly yeah. yeah so uh well i am i am pleased that you're here i'm not humbled or honored that you're here because i'm entitled 
to your time and right. uh, your knowledge. You're, you you're, this. you're entitled. You're uh, what, what do you say? You're a millennial, right? So you're entitled. Is that right? I'm entitled to my correct. Just opinion. lost eighty percent of the podcast right there. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, no. I think most of them are probably in their uh, in their forties, maybe their fifties. So I think they're probably like, okay. yeah, yeah, that yeah. is right. Like I'm the one millennial. I like they like. already. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, but you know, I, you and I have talked about doing a podcast for a while. I remember reaching out. Uh, it was in 2020, and uh, it was it was earlier in the year. And I think it was just like, you know, you were like, it was toward the beginning of the year. You're like very busy, and you were like, reach out in like April. And then by April, I just I wasn't very consistent with. I, I had no excuse. I just didn't reach out. We had, we had a little something come up right around March, April, didn't we? Right. Yeah. Well, theoretically, that should have helped. It should have been like I should have, you know, doubled down and done more podcasts. But I, uh, you know, I, I still spread them out. I uh, but so I'm finally getting to you. The 2020 podcast has uh, finally reached. You're, you're on the you're on the April schedule. That's right. So. Exactly. Exactly. Ten months behind. So at least we made it. Right. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. That's good. That's uh, all yeah. And, you know, we almost didn't make it. Well, we had last week we were going to do this podcast, but then, you know, heck froze over and literally like half this country was like a, like a sheet of ice. Yeah. Yeah. And Man, remarkably, they got work in Texas right now, right? Or in the Houston area. That's brutal. Those guys. Yeah. I've heard that it. it's pretty, uh, pretty nasty. Like, you know, I've seen like wind, what is it? Like the wind generators, like frozen up like yeah. wind, or something like that. Yeah. Pretty bad. Pretty yeah. Bad. So if you were from Texas and you were listening, our hearts go out to you, um, come to a warmer place like Nebraska. Uh, That's right. we would love to have you we yeah, have the, the mountains of colorado yeah correct we have snow removal here so <laughs> i'm not taunting i'm just saying because uh, it really is a terrible situation but uh yeah, it's pretty bad yeah, yeah one, of my, one of my clients went down there to see her grandmother and then she texted me she said you're never gonna believe this but we just lost power and water I'm like what you're in houston <laughs> yeah i know so it's unreal uh, yeah so texans stay safe stay safe um, by the want. time this podcast goes up, you guys will probably be fine. But just know that we definitely are – our heart was in it, even if yep. the timing was not right. That's right. Now, speaking of timing not being right, this is not going to be a good segue because we're not going to talk about timing at all. Well, I guess <laughs> we kind of are. We're going to talk about <laughs> – we're going to talk about uh, Father Time is unrelenting madman and wants nothing more than to take away your gains, or so people think. Yeah. But – you know, you're in your late 40s, as I recall, and you're still strong as an ox, maybe stronger than you have been in a long time. So what's that all about? It depends on what movements we're talking about. <clears throat> you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not putting up the numbers I did when I was in my early 20s, but I'm doing things that I couldn't do in my early 20s. So, you know, there's a, there's a little bit of give and take. Plus, my priorities are totally different. Sure. But, you know, the, the rumor is, or the, I don't know if it's a rumor, I'd say the general consensus or the uh, I think that's probably a good term. You, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, is that you got to get weak as you age, right? And that's that's not true at all. You can actually get stronger as you get older. I mean, I think just off the top of my head, Jack Lane was doing. He died from pneumonia at 98 or 99, and he was doing finger like one arm fingertip outstretched push ups at 98, 99. And you yeah. could argue, well, you know, Jack was doing that back when he was in his 30s. Okay, but. So what? He maintained it for 60 years. Yeah. Right? So, and uh, I just saw a, an article slash research paper I don't know, a couple of weeks ago on a study, and I apologize, I, don't, I can't quote it off the top of my head, but it was a study done with 20-somethings and a study done with 40-somethings, early 50-somethings men. And uh, sorry, ladies, I, I, I don't have a study to quote for any of the ladies, but I think we could probably paint with a broad brush since we're all human. Correct. Um, <clears throat> they both gained, both groups gained muscle and strength, but the, the older gentlemen gained more muscle and more strength than the, than the younger crowd, which is, you know, completely the opposite of what you'd expect. So there are also some studies done uh, about 70 year olds, 70 year olds still being able to gain muscle at a, and gain strength at a, at a relatively normal rate. Mm -hmm. So um, it's just, it's just a falsehood, I think. Um, urban myth, urban legend, whatever you want to call it, common sense, that's not common at all, common vernacular, wh whatever term you want to use. But most people think that your best days are behind you once you know, you're out of college and you, you know, settle down and start a family. But that's, that's not true at all. So. 
Now you train a lot of people who are, who basically fit that profile. They're maybe in their forties, fifties or older. Yep. Um, you know, these aren't people who have like all day, every day to train. They're not professional athletes. These are, you know, people with families or people with uh, stressful jobs. Sure. And yet you guide them sometimes in person, often from a distance to go from point A to point B. And in many cases, these are places, they're not like meeting PRs that they had, you know, 20 years earlier. These are like brand new lifetime PRs. Sure. So like, what are the things that people really need to consider as they get older? I mean, to me, there are a couple of things that come to mind, but, um, but I'm curious of what you have found uh, is, are some of the keys to success at uh, training and gaining past the age of 40? Training and gaining past the age of 40. Um, <clears throat> I think the biggest thing is understanding that, you know, uh, you may have heard of the SRA curve, right? Um, stress response adaptation curve. Mm -hmm. That applies to everybody. It just applies differently to people of different ages, right? So for, if you're under stress, which most of us are, we all process stress differently. So that curve looks a lot different per person. Right. And it depends on what, what kind of things you're doing. Um, I first learned this. Sorry to, sorry to say this, but like half a lifetime ago, it's hard to believe my, my weightlifting coach, a guy named Alfonso Duran was a, he is a Cuban emigre. He's probably in his early to mid seventies right now. Mm -hmm. And so we had this conversation when he was about my age and I was 23, 24, right? 23. And I had just transitioned from a super hardcore six days a week Bulgarian-esque training program, which means I worked up to a heavy max pretty much every workout, to a, no, six days a week, to a three-day-a-week program under his guidance. And I was, I was blown away because I, it was insulting, quite frankly. I was like, what, you think I can't handle this? You think, you know, like I'm not strong enough, blah, 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 blah. But my entire life had changed. Right. I had started a new job. I was commuting from uh, New Jersey into New York on the 545 in the morning train, you know, and coming back late at night on sometimes on the 11 p.m. train. I was uh, training clients in New York City, that sort of thing. So I didn't have the same schedule. And, and one of the things he told me, and the reason this is so important to our listeners is this guy was essentially a professional athlete. So he was on the Cuban pre-select squad, which was the, tr the, the, the team just before they traveled. So the reason it was pre-select is you had to make sure you checked all the, the communist boxes and he didn't check the communist box. So he didn't get to travel, but their job was to train and rest. So his typical day was I would train three to four hours a day and then I would go do whatever I wanted. He said once a month, I think it was once a month or once a week, he would get a vitamin shot in the butt and Every 30 days at the end of the month, he'd go down to the manufacturing plant and pick up his paycheck, right? So that was the life that he lived. And, you know, a lot of us like these, well, I, I can't speak for, I can't speak for everybody, but me personally, I love, I spent the first 10 or 15 years of my professional life just designing perfectly, what I thought perfectly periodized programs based on the Soviet methodology. And one of the things he told me, which I completely discounted until I was probably in my early 40s and after I'd injured pretty much every body part not listening to him is that people who have lives can't train that way right all that stuff is based on professional athletes now it's not to say that it doesn't work it just has to be distilled correctly and most of us don't we you know we take what we look you know see in the yearbooks the Soviet weightlifting yearbooks, and we try and apply that to our lives. And we wonder why we blow up because we can't handle that. We, have, we don't have the conditioning or the, the GPP base to be able to handle that. And so he told me, he said, yeah, listen, this stuff doesn't work, right? If you have a job, <laughs> a wife, right? Kids, 2.5 mortgages, bills to pay because of that stress, that SRA curve, right? All those things are stressors that slow down the adaptation process. So over 40, that's when we're really feeling things. So our kids are, my kids are 10 and seven, almost 10 and seven respectively. We got a late start, but most parents, they have teenagers who are over 40 and their, their kids are 
two to five years away from leaving the nest and then they have college to worry about, right? So the kids aren't home, but they do have to worry about college and what the kids are getting into in college and whether or not they have the bills to pay for college and they got their mortgage and their second mortgage and whatever. But you, you get the point. There's a lot of stuff out there. So we can't just paint with the exact same brush strokes that we would have when we're 17, 18, 19, 23, 24, single, right? That sort of thing. So that's probably the biggest thing to take away. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes perfect sense. And it reminds me of uh, a meme that I, I've seen going around. And uh, unlike a lot of memes, there was actually quite a bit of wisdom in this one. I thought it was good. It was like, uh, you know, the biggest um, biggest cause of injury for uh, a training injury for men over 40 is or let's, it was the biggest uh, cause of injury in working out uh, for old men is training like they're young men. And, you know, I, we've probably all heard the horror stories of somebody like, oh, I'm going to try to, you know, do in the gym what I used to do or, or whatever. And they, they twist something, they break something or strain or, or what have you. And it's not just about not being warmed up. It's also about not having the right priorities. Like you could probably get back to some of these, these big numbers whether it's with a barbell or kettlebell or what have you, but you have to, you have to focus on like what you said. I mean, this is one of the biggest takeaways I've ever gotten. I have like five major epiphanies in my strength training uh, career as it were. And one of them is that it's not how much work you can do. It's how much work you can recover from. And I think that people really discount that. And I, what I always say is that it's, if you want to improve your recovery, you got to improve your, your uh, sleep and your eating habits. But you know, from what you're saying, I, I have to say that it sounds like it's not really complete because you've also got to worry about stress in your day-to-day -day life. Like, you know, what are your kids getting into in, in college? Are they getting good grades? Um, you know, oh, junior just got into a fender bender and we got to pay for that and you know, deal with insurance. So when there are these other life stressors, how does that affect the SRA curve? And, and how do you adjust a program when something like that happens? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I use, with all my clients, I use what's called auto-regulation, which means I give them a broad set of guidelines with some very specific data points. And then I let them build the daily, what I call the dailies of their programs, right? So uh, a good example would be, all right, we're going to, and I use a lot of RPEs, rate of perceived exertion. So we use a scale of one to 10, 10 is maximum. That's all I've got. I'm going all out. We rarely go to 10. We'll go to 10. We do maxes every eight to 16 weeks, depending on the person. Some people, we don't ever go to maxes because it's just not what they want. And it's just not their personality. I've had, I have had clients, um, they literally freeze up when they have to max and their entire life crumbles. It's too much stress for them. And uh, so we just don't do stuff like that. So we use a rate of perceived exertion. I generally stay between seven and nine. What does that look like percentage-wise? That looks anywhere from 50% to 90% generally. Uh, we do most of our work in the, I'd say 60 to 80, 60 to 85% range. And um, we use indicators like speed. My biggest, the biggest thing I learned from Alfonso, which, which was this, when the speed of your movement decreases, then you're done with that set, right? He. I kind of finagled him a little bit to, to allow me to do another rep. So I always have like a little caveat in there because it could be a lapse of concentration. So I always give myself one more rep. And if that rep is faster, then I'm good to go. If it's not, I'm done. So how does that play out? Well, I, let's say I've got a set of five. Um, I do three, four slows down. Technically the set should be done, but if I can get five and it's faster than number four, I'm good to go. If it's slower than number four, right, done. So or let's say six reps. Let's say, you know, you, you falter on three and you get six or seven reps. Not right. that you would use six or seven reps. Unless, of course, we programmed you to do six or seven reps. Right. So, so that would be an example. So we use a very uh, qualitative uh, methodology. So everything is based on feel, uh, essentially. And so what you'll see is you'll see a wide variation in the amount of work that's done throughout a week and over a, like a monthly cycle or over a three-week cycle. Uh, three month cycle, excuse me, but but because everybody has this range in which they can play, right? It's not a strict box. Like you must do 80% for five sets of five or else, right? With two minutes and 47 seconds of rest. Mm -hmm. right? It's not like that. 
because it's as loose and as fluid and flexible as it is, everybody just keeps getting bigger and stronger. And when I got one guy, he's um, trying to think he's in his early to mid forties and he's on a lifetime. Uh, we've been working together about eight months now and he's had a lifetime high in body weight and muscularity without really even trying. Well, what we've done is we've reduced his stress and increased his training enjoyability because he used to train in such a way where he would put a ton of pressure on him on himself. Right. And it would mess with his mind. And then he was irritable and that would cause family issues. And, you know, his wife thought he was a jerk. No, I'm just, that was my wife thinking I was a jerk. Uh, <laughs> Cause I was, uh, but in all seriousness, it, as soon as, he learned this programming style he put on, we were just talking the other day and in eight months he's put on like 1.5% body fat. And I want to say about 13 pounds of lean body mass. That's pretty incredible. In, yeah. And this isn't, is I think he's 43, 44, something like that. Right. And he's got two, two kids at home. Uh, one's about to be a teenager, one's full blown teenager. Right. So he doesn't have a, it's not all, you know, cake and cookies. Yeah. So, yeah. And he, he just loves it. He's gets stronger and stronger and leaner and, I mean, that's, that's some pretty good results. Definitely. You know, I'm, I'm a big fan of like training five days a week. Uh, that's my preferred approach. And, uh, but the crazy thing is, and you know, a lot of people too, that I, who follow me um, or who I've trained, like they've kind of adopted the same thing, but like the thing I have to work on the most is not getting them to train more. I think people instinctively understand that the more frequently you train, theoretically, the better your results may be, but mm -hmm it's uh, giving themselves permission to do less. Right. Like the, the idea that, you know, you have, they know, okay, I can't go all out every single time. Like, you know, most of them come to me already knowing that, but then the idea that, you know, Hey, maybe you don't have to do your 10 sets of 10 swings today. Maybe just do like a few sets of like five and just call it done or just do one set. And if it doesn't feel like good enough to do another set, you know, like you have permission to just like, if you only yeah. slept three hours, your kid was up all night puking, like you don't owe anybody a workout, like you owe it to yourself to maybe do that workout at a time when it's, it's going to make more sense or to do like a fraction of it. But, yeah. um, but yeah, a lot of people uh, just think that they, they can't like, if it's on paper, like it might as well have been carved into stone on Mount Sinai <laughs> and exactly the same thing, man. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. And I, I try to impress that upon people. And I remember there was one young lad that I was training when I lived in Israel. And I told him like, look, you know, you'd be amazed. Even if you only do like a third or a quarter of what I tell you to do, um, you, you can still get good results. He's like, don't tell me that. Cause then I'm only going to do like a third or a quarter. I'm like, you're, you're missing the point. Like right. do something. Cause for him, it was either like six days a week or zero. And it's not an exaggeration. It was like 16, you know, so kids are very much like that, but those attitudes sometimes get carried into adulthood. Now, how do you, how do you convince people to kind of follow their gut and use the RPE scale or, um, you know, stop when the sets, when the, when the reps start to slow down, like how do you coach them into accepting that that is perfectly acceptable? Uh, I don't really have to, cause I'm the coach. So there's the, there's the hierarchical that, I mean, they're paying me to give them the best advice and they know I'm not going to steer them, you know, steer them into the mud. Right. So they, they just generally listen to me. I don't, uh, <clears throat> there's one guy I can think of and he's shiny object squirrel guy. So I've had to keep him on the straight and narrow, like real tight, real tight reins on him. Uh, but generally speaking, once you get going and you give them the guidelines, the results start right away. And that's enough. Like that speaks for the, the results speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, I had, uh, I have got one girl, one lady, and she is over 45. You would know her by name if I pointed her out, but she's about 135 pounds and she just lifetime PR'd her pull up the other, I don't know, maybe within the last four weeks, 32 kilos. Wow. Yeah. And she works a full-time job. She's got teenagers Life is not perfect. She's not a, you know, uh, like a real Hollywood housewife or anything like that. I mean, she's a real living person who's got, you know, husband, family, you know, all that stuff. Works 50 hours a week, you know, balances, juggles everything. So th this isn't, uh, these aren't perfect people, right? None of us are perfect people that we're, we're dealing with this. This is not what you see in Hollywood, right? Mm -hmm. So 
yeah, it can be done. And people generally, once they, once they realize that they don't have to do all this, there's almost like a, a freedom. They experience a release and they go, they go, oh, wow, I don't have to work quite as hard. Mm-hmm. And then some days, you know, the rule is if you feel good, then, you know, you get to go for it. So, you know, the same, the same person, she was telling me yesterday, we had our weekly debrief, which is what we do every, every week. I have a client with my clients. We have a weekly Zoom call or a phone call and we do a weekly debrief. We go over goods and bads and everything. And she said, yeah, you know, I happen to have the day off and I felt really good. So I took that session and instead of doing X number of sets, I did Y number of sets. And then I felt so good. I, you know, two hours later, I came back and did more. Right. So they have the freedom to do that as well. And I, I think that's the biggest thing about this type of training is it's, it's freedom. And, you know, one of the, the biggest aha moments I had, you, you touched on this before people think if it's written on a paper, it's set in stone, you know, it's the, one of the, one of the 11 commandments. <laughs> so, I don't know. There's uh, an 11th one in there somewhere. Yeah. 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 Something like that. There was, um, Thou shalt listen to the hammer cast. That's what it was. That's pretty, pretty close. Right. Yes. But, uh, one of the biggest aha moments I had was training with Alfonso. And he said, no, no, you don't understand. Cause I was a hard worker and I prided myself on, if you wrote that down, come hell or high water, man, come heck or high water. Sorry. This is a gift. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, <clears throat> I was going to do it. And he said, no, no, you don't understand. He said, if I write down, 75% for five sets of five. What I mean is do no more than 75% for five sets of five. So if you do a set of five, a set of five, a set of four, a set of three, and a set of two, I'm perfectly happy with that. Wow. That took me a long, long time to wrap my head around. But I, he told me that when I was 25, right? 24, 25. So. One of those things that it, it's like, you have to experience it for yourself to understand why it works. Yeah. Listen, you can be hardcore. You can be as hardcore as they come. But when you get that first, second, or third injury and you can't do what you want to do, you'll suddenly start reconsidering how hardcore you are. Yeah. Right? Especially if you're a dad or a mom and you got little ones and you have a life outside of the gym. Right. When you're single, and you're 20 something and all you do is lift and go to work, you may not have a life outside of the gym and that's fine. You can be as hardcore as you want and you can get injured and live with it for a little bit. But when you're my age and you get injured, that means you can't roll with your 10 year old soon to be 10 year old who loves nothing more than to punch and elbow and knee and test himself against you. Right. And then, so now you're stealing from your family and now you're creating bad memories going on a little tangent here, but no, but it's good. Get what I'm saying, right? So all this stuff is meant to dis- is meant to augment your life and make your life better. So there's no room for hardcore, right? It's just to make you better at what you already do, make you a better husband, make you a better father, make you a better mother, make you a better wife. What, is that even politically correct to say these things anymore? I don't know. No, uh, but I like it. Keep going. Better boss, better employee, better at whatever it is that you want to do. Exactly. You know, I think that um, the, I, I think, the really important thing is you have to change people's perspective because who's more hardcore? Like, you know, the guy who can do what he wants or the gal who can do what she wants, you know, when they want, whenever, or the guy or the gal who's constantly nursing some sort of an injury, you know, has to tell the kids, "Ah, I can't play catch tonight. You know, my shoulder's bothering me or bench press, heavy bench. They're not going to understand. The only thing they're going to understand is that you said no. And you know, they may not carry it with them for the rest of their life, but it's still like, these are moments that when they're gone, they're gone. You don't get them back. That's right. I mean, listen, I saw this, uh, I saw this movie. I shall not name the movie, but it was about a very famous powerlifting team. And um, this guy had tears in his eyes when he was telling the story. And he said, my son was a championship swimmer, but I never went to one of his meets. Because his meet was on when his meets were on Wednesday nights, and Wednesday was bench press day, and his his state championship meet was on a Wednesday, and I didn't. I think I, I might be exaggerating. It may have been on a Saturday, right? But the big the big take home was I didn't go because it was bench press day, right? Now, I would go out on a limb and say this guy had his priorities wrong. 
right? Like if you're trying to instill the benefit of taking care of yourself into your children and living a healthy, strong life, that would probably be the wrong way to go about it. Yeah. I can't take care of you because I'm, you know, it's bench press day. Yeah. You know, so, you know, this stuff is, in my opinion, is meant to, your kids should know that you, you know, mommy, daddy, they take care of themselves. They have their exercise time, but it shouldn't be at the expense of the family. Right. And exactly. Yeah. I'm saying that as somebody who's done that, right. Where I've had to readjust when I train because it's interfered with family life. Right. Yeah. So. And that's the other thing that um, I think people have a hard time with too, because you talk about readjusting things so that it, it fits well with your family life rather than becomes a question of which one do I choose? Right. And one of the things that I have run across that um, it, it, in a way it surprises me because it's not actually that revolutionary is that there are a lot of people that I talk to who are like, look, I just can't spend an hour a day working out. And I'm like, who told you you had to? Like, right. You, yeah. you, you can do 15 minutes and you'd be amazed at like the amount of work you can get done. Like, you know, one of the big things that I've really tried to instill in people over the last few years that either that I've trained or friends of mine, I'm like, just make a five minute daily commitment to do something. You can do more than five minutes if you want, but how many push ups can you do in five minutes? Like, you know, maybe you can, maybe you can do like five per minute and bam, that's 25 push ups. Are you going to be better off doing 25 push ups a day or zero? Yeah. Right. That's exactly right. You know, I always had something, um, same, same train of thought with my clients. I had a, when I had my Brooks and mortar business, I had several clients that I would just see once a week and we used the something's better than nothing ideology or methodology, which was, okay, take 10 minutes, do something for 10 minutes. Can you find 10 minutes? Of course you can. Right. Like, and so we would just get them doing something for 10 minutes. Like you yeah. said, push-ups. Can you do 25 push-ups? Can you do, how many swings can you do in 10 minutes? And then we would build and it creates momentum, you know? So That's I've got a whole program out there I put together. It's an annual plan essentially for people. And it's 15 minutes a day, five days a week. Do it on the same day as work days and then take your weekends off. And yeah. you'd be surprised. One guy said, I could not believe this. He goes, if you had told me that just doing this 15 minutes a day, five days a week would have gotten me these results. And he's a cop... Uh, police officer um, in the Netherlands and he's in his early forties and he passed the SFG snatch test just training 15 minutes a day. It's so incredible. a little bit, a long way compounded over time consistently can change, revolutionize your life. Yeah. I mean, it really is like the, the, the physical embodiment of the tortoise and the hare story, you know, like, so many people start off strong and I'm, I'm guilty of this. Usually not with training. It's typically with like other things, but you know, like I'm going to go gung ho, like, and I, this is right out of the gate. And then it's like, it lasts for a few days or a few weeks and you just can't keep up with it. The better thing is to, like you said, you got 10 to 15 minutes, you apply yourself and you will, you will be amazed at what happens. Yeah. I mean, 15 minutes a day, five days a week. What is that? That's an hour, five minutes, 15 minutes, right? Yeah doesn't seem like much i mean because it's it's like you said we have this idea you alluded to it like i got to do an hour a day what's a good workout oh it's an hour right like i don't have an hour a day so i'm not going to get a good workout and therefore i may as well not even bother to work out yeah right because, because your aerobics class is an hour yeah your dvd that you bought off of amazon is an hour and your personal training session is an hour right yeah so you can't really I was going to say, you really can't blame them for, for kind of internalizing this. No, it's the way everything's been packaged and sold to them, right? So it's essentially a reframe. You have to reapproach the, uh, the problem from yeah. a different angle. You know, one thing I want, to, I want to riff on is you mentioned momentum. And I really think that momentum is more important than motivation because everybody, and people are always like, how do you stay motivated? I'm like, I'm not motivated. Like, I've got something I got to do. Like I'm emotionless when I go into the gym. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm happy to like see people, you know, and I'm happy to, to do the work, but I'm not, I'm not like chomping at the bit or like completely like jazzed about whatever it is that I'm going to do. I see it as like a brick in the wall. And so I'm only focused on the brick. I'm not, you know, obsessing over this wall and thinking like, how am I going to, you know, build it from, you know, ground to like 20 feet or, or whatever. It's just one session. I just come in, do the work, and then I leave. 
And uh, people instinctively understand this with other things or, you know, slowing down sometimes. Again, people un understand this, but, um, but the, I, th I find it to be like, a, it's more coming out of like their, their self-consciousness that they don't want to do less because they think that means that they're settling for less. And uh, I, like, I think if you can convince somebody that it's momentum and not motivation and it's commitment and not, you know, like just these insane goals that sound cool on Facebook, that that's what's actually going to help. And it's, it's not all these other things. But, uh, you know, you made a good point. You're the coach, so people listen to you. But for those of you who are listening, who are maybe thinking like, ah, I haven't worked out in two weeks. I just don't have that hour. Jeff is telling you, you don't need it. He's got his planual, I'm going to call it planual, annual plan, the planual that can get you there. Yeah. You just go pick something that you know you can do. So I, I use this a lot with my clients. It's like, what's, we talk a lot about, uh, you know, motivation and momentum. It's, it's the thing that's the easiest thing to do, mm -hmm. right? That's what creates the momentum. The thing that, that doesn't have the attached with it. The thing that makes you go, oh yeah, I could do that. Right? Well, of course I could do that. Well, could you do, could you do 10 swings? Yeah, of course I could. How about, how about 20 swings? Well, yeah, of course I could. What about 50? Uh, okay. So go do 20. How about pushups? Same thing, right? Like it's, it's just finding what that, that starting point is. Exactly. And then having like a check the box mentality, right? You have your to-do list, check the box, check the box, check the box. Right. And um, that seems to work really well for people, but I, I find a lot of it is just what I spoke about just a few seconds ago. It's that how does it, how does it make you feel? Because we, we have these grand ideas. Well, you know, I'm going to go train with the Navy SEALs and I'm going to do the, the Go Ruck 4 million. And uh, well, when was the last time you actually went outside and walked? Well, uh, I haven't because it's been raining. You do realize that they're going to put you in the ocean and make you go through snow and rain and all that other stuff. So how about we just get you outside for a walk? Yeah. Right? Like, so it's like the, what's the easiest first step you can do? And then what's the easiest second step you can do? And then the third step. And then that's how you create that momentum. And then it's the momentum, which breeds the results, right? Which breeds the consistency, which is what keeps you motivated. Exactly. Exactly. You know, I, you, bring up walk, you bring up walking, and I think that um, one of the best stories I ever heard about the power of walking for fitness was one that you told. And it was about, you read a book about a guy who's one of the first dudes in the Delta Force. And all of their training was not, you know, they weren't doing like, and Delta Force, for anybody who doesn't know, like, these are some hard dudes. These are not like, you know, these, they're not like, uh, and this is not to insult anybody in the armed forces, but they don't have a desk job. Like, they are out in the field. That's comparable to the, to the seals. I think it's fair to say. Yes, it it is comparable. In fact, some might say you'd be insulting the Delta by calling them seals. <laughs> right. That's why I said it was I was comparable because I I don't I don't want any Delta Force member to you know show up at random while I'm while I'm lifting like hey. Well, you'd never know. I mean, that's the beautiful thing about Delta. That's what they do, right? They're, they're anti they're an anti terrorist unit, so you'd never know that they, they even showed up. Exactly. You wouldn't know until you woke up in the hospital, like what happened? And then they would tell you this, this story. And the story would probably not, the story would probably be cooler sounding than the one that you regaled us with. But there, the, one of the guys who was on this first team, like they just walked, like, I think their job was to, was to make maps of like the areas that they, that they needed. They, they were given a map and a compass and they were told to pack their bag and they had all their deer in their bag and they had their own food that they packed. And they said, they dropped them off. This is in the mountains of North Carolina. Uh, Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin, it's his book. I can't remember what it's called. It's got like a couple stars on the, like three or four stars on the cover. That's how I remember it. But they, they called it the long walk. So yeah, he was in the first, the first Delta Force group. And it was, um, they wake you up before dawn, they drop you off and, you know, they, they put you in the back of a truck and they drop you off in the woods and they say, these are the coordinates you are now. You got to get to these coordinates by this time. Go. And if you're not there, you know, you're done. And it's, it's not, it's not a good story. One of my very good friends did the Q course for Delta. That's the called, I believe it's called the Q course and that's what it is. It's Delta. And he went through it. He, these guys are so hardcore. He broke both his feet and washed out the day before because his times were going down. Right. The guys walking through the mountains with broken feet. Right. So how's that for motivation? But yeah, so back to, back to the book. 
they did this and there was the, it ended, the course was over when they, when the people in charge said it was over. So they had no idea how long they would do this. And they just did it every single day and carrying a pack through the woods in the mountains of North Carolina. I think they did it for somewhere between 30 and 45 days. He said he lost 30 pounds. No problem. And think about that. I mean, that's just walking. He's not, he's not doing hill sprints. He wasn't doing snatches. Now you might say, all right, well, he's got a, you know, he's got a pack on, he's weighed down, he's got all day, but truth be told, you know, again, he's probably also got a work capacity that's so much higher than the rest of ours. And he's able to handle that kind of, you know, volume of walking, but um, it, it, walking is really one of the most underrated ways of getting fit getting in shape. I think it's positively associated with pretty much every like healthy biomarker in your mm -hmm. entire body, yep. but nobody wants to do it. Everybody it's wants, cool, man. yeah, it's not cool. It's not Ninja. It's not hashtag Navy seal, <laughs> but it really is because like these guys don't have a, a hard time walking. I mean, th like th they have to do that. They have to, they have to do a lot of different things. Um, so if you're really not willing to get good at the basics, you have to accept that you're not going to get good at any of the, the truly ninja stuff. Yeah, that's right. Because the basics is what builds the foundation for the ninja. Exactly. And I'm not gonna, the kind of person who thinks that you need to do the basics ad infinitum. You know, I know that there are a lot of people who are like, I'm not insulting. I'm kind of insulting them. Um, I, I don't think that that's the way to go. I, I do think that you should experiment. You should do other things. But there are enough basic movements that you should be able to do them without getting too too quickly bored. Right. Um, but but when it comes down to it, like you, you do have to get good at them. So when you're, when you're making an exercise selection, let's say for your, for your students, what are some of the things that you have to keep in mind? Cause uh, again, we're assuming that they're, they're probably, you know, past the age of 40 or 50, um, have limited time, maybe limited equipment, uh, and they may have some physical limitations as well. So considering these limits, how do you get them these eye popping results, you know, apart from again, at the time and everything like, uh, everything like that, just 15 minutes, whatever they can commit to when it comes to the actual exercise selection and then working around, um, things that are, that are specific to themselves, like a bum shoulder, you know, maybe a knee that got hurt in college. Um, what are the things that you do to make sure that they are not aggravating it, maybe even making it better and then still losing fat, building muscle and, and getting strong. One of the things, well, we stick again, basic. So basic movements, um, all my clients and make sure all my clients, but one, and that's just because he's a squirrel guy. And so I keep him on a very narrow track. He's lost, he's in his mid sixties and he's lost 50 some pounds just doing swings and push ups. Um, and he's stronger than he's ever been. So he's doing swings with the 32, but it's, it's just showing up. So first thing we do is get them to show up. The second thing we do is we, I consider their training background, their training history and their injury history. And then their, their program is based on those things. My, my biggest issue is I want my clients to be able to be free to move as much as they want to and as well as they can. So I always, 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 always go after movement issues. And the reason I do that is because I've had my own movement issues in the past. And I know how limiting they can be. And I know the joy and the freedom of eliminating those things and be able to do things that I once did and be able to do things I've never done before. So case in point, uh, before I was 39, I could never do a bodyweight pistol. Right now I can do them, no problem. Um, before I was... 32, I could never do a regular, like a, a counterbalance pistol. Those things came from addressing injuries, mm -hmm. right? The injuries were created through that hardcore mentality and through movement compensations slash movement dysfunctions that were created by that hardcore mentality, right? And so addressing all that. So that's what I address primarily with my clients and we build on top of that. So I always want to make sure they can move well. They can move certainly pain-free. We actually pull the car over to the side of the road when they have any sort of issues that pop up and we address it on the Zoom immediately. I do a test retest methodology. Uh, you're familiar with the original strength. Mm -hmm. So we use the, the test retest methodology from OS. And uh, that's basically it. So what kind of exercises we do? Squats, 
Uh, we do all kinds of body weight exercises. We do all kinds of kettlebell exercises. The biggest issues I see with kettlebell exercises that need to be taken care of are lower backs and shoulders. Those are especially common in runners and desk jockeys. So those are the first two things we always take care of. Um, with the lower backs, more often than not, it's some kind of core dysfunction and breathing dysfunction, which is a core dysfunction. And same thing with shoulders. Uh, we often clear both of those up at the same time doing some very structured restorative work. Mm -hmm. So does that, does that answer your question? Very much so. Yeah. You know, and again, that goes back to uh, just honoring those basics and being willing to look at what's actually the, the source of the problem rather than just the symptoms. Yeah. I think that uh, there are a lot of the symptom management systems out there that, that have, I actually, I, I like them to a certain degree because I do think they have some gold in them, but they don't necessarily uh, rid you of the circumstances that put you in the position where you have all these symptoms. Correct. Yeah, correct. And you know, what's really interesting, you talk about creating momentum. Um, a lot of my clients, the ones who are, who are serious, uh, and that's most of them work out, they train five to six days a week. You're like, well, how do you get them to do that? Well, I get them to feel so good, or they get themselves to feel so good through doing this, this restorative work that they enjoy training, mm -hmm. right? And it just, it augments and enhances every other area of their lives. So uh, they're, they're happier. They're generally happier because they're, when you feel bad, you don't realize how bad you feel until you remove the badness mm -hmm. and you start feeling good. And then, wow, things seem a little brighter, right? The eyes open up a little wider. You smile a little bit more frequently. You know, you don't get in as many fights with your kids or your spouse and life generally gets better. And so there's a lot of other positive feedback mechanisms um, that start popping up when you start training correctly, right? So whether it's 10 minutes, six days a week, or 30 minutes, three times a week, the momentum builds up. And as long as you're doing the right things correctly, then you're going to start moving better. You're going to start getting stronger. You'll start putting on some muscle by default. Uh, you'll start, a lot of my clients start asking questions that they wouldn't have normally asked, which precipitate answers they wouldn't have known to look for mm -hmm. and that enhances right their results and that enhances the rest of their lives and so generally life just gets better for them the further they dig into this process that's the way to be um yeah. you know i think that uh the clearer that you can make that for somebody the easier it's going to be to get them to commit and be compliant and, uh, you know, when they feel good, they're not going to, they're not going to argue with you about like, ah, I don't want to do swings again or, or whatever. They're, they're going to be excited to do whatever continues to work. Yeah. And the, the wonderful thing, you know, we're talking about the stress before they know to look out for, you know, stressful circumstances like fights with the boss or staying up late or not sleeping. And they can tell the difference in how the swings feel or how the squats feel, whether the hips are stiff or the shoulders are stiff mm -hmm. based on the stress. Right. And they, I give them the tools to be able to manage that on their own. So they're not like just waiting for me all the time. And they realize that. And they, so they have that nice little positive feedback. Oh, I use this tool. I get better. I'm going to use this tool more frequently. Exactly. You know, and I'm going to get better more frequently. So everything just, it's like a picture that gets brighter and brighter. Yeah. You know? It's a great way to describe it. Uh, I got to ask before we wrap up, what are some of the new projects you are working on? Anything new coming out? Anything exciting? Anything that's already out that you would like to uh, tell us about, boast about perhaps? Uh, boast, no. Um, probably the biggest project that I'm working on is last year I put out this thing called the Sore Knee Solution mm -hmm. based on 25 years of having chronic bilateral knee pain, which was just so, so much fun and uh, absolving myself of that. So I put out that, um, the interesting thing with that, and I use this with all my clients is there's a, there's a methodology behind that. It's called the P3 protocol. I use that with all my clients and we've seen some really spectacular successes from that. Um, we've had people clear up their shoulder issues. We've had, had one of my clients came to me specifically cause she was looking at neck surgery. She's looking at cervical fusion. We use that, cleared her up. Um, so it's, it's really powerful. I think that's the, the thing that excites me most. I love talking about lifting heavy weights and pressing heavy things and pulling heavy things and squatting and running and sprinting and 
you know, doing all kinds of things, but it's, for me, that sort of thing is what allows all the other stuff to happen. And so I get pretty jazzed about doing that because uh, the way we're designed, man, we're created, God created us to be able to restore ourselves. Right. And uh, the beautiful thing about that is this, this machine can last a really long time if you, if you take care of it and if you know how to take care of it. Mm -hmm. So I think that's probably the, the biggest thing. I think that's one of the most important, actually. Like, you know, I know that you were a big factor in the success of uh, Original Strength and uh, really promoting it. And, you know, I didn't have a whole ton of physical issues when I started doing it, but I did it because I wanted to help my mom because, you know, I, I knew that, like, if I had her try to lift kettlebells, it was going to be disastrous. And so that's kind of one of the things that opened my eyes to maybe there's more to life and movement than just lifting heavy stuff. I mean, maybe that's a big and important part of it. But if you don't feel good, like you said, uh, it, it's going to have an impact elsewhere. And nothing feels better than feeling better. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a, that's a, that's a qualitative and individual thing, right? You can't, really put a, you can't really put like a pin in that per se yeah. and say, oh, well, this is the point. Like this, this number is how I feel better. I mean, it's different for everybody. So, I mean, whether it's you're carrying around lower back pain for 30 years and suddenly you figure out a way to make it go away and and stay away. That's, that's huge. Yeah. I mean, this day I still have the imprint of going up the stairs and coming down the stairs with my knees yelling at me every time. And so it's been a good 10 years probably since that has happened where I had that barking and that, that sharp pain, especially my right knee, but it, it was so ingrained that even today I go up and down the stairs and go, wow, that's not there. You know, yeah, this makes me smile. I'm like, wow, that's not there. How long is that going to last? I don't know. Well, I had 25 years, so maybe I got another 15 years or 16 years before I no longer go, wow, that's amazing. But that's the goal is to, is to go that distance and be able to enjoy yourself along the way. Yeah. Yeah. And not kind of suffer and just quote unquote, ride it out or phone it in or punch it in. You know, I, I, um, I look at senior citizens, you know, those who are over 60 and, uh, I don't even know if we're allowed to call them senior citizens. I don't know. That's so call cool. them old people. That's what I call them. Yeah, all those old geezers, right? <laughs> the enfeebled is a, <laughs> that's yeah. another good word for them. You know, um, and we just don't have to live that way. Yeah. Right? And you don't need hormone replacement therapy to not live that way. Like, you don't need to be the 50-year-old guy who gets the 250 cc's of test every two weeks or whatever the going amount is. I don't even know. Right. Uh, you know, unless of course, maybe you had testicular cancer and, you know, you don't have any gonads. So well, then you have an excuse, right? So, right. Um, but yeah, our, our bodies are designed to be used and I'd rather um, wear out than rust out. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. My, uh, both my grandfathers, my dad's dad was dead at 61. He had his first uh, heart attack at 46, right? Um, my mom's dad was dead at 73 from a stroke. My dad is, God bless him, you know, he's like 74, 74. And he suffers from Alzheimer's and dementia, right? So, but he always struggled to take care of himself. It was never like a priority, mm -hmm. right? So I've had a lot of, this is what not to do. Yeah. Right, so... And I know being at my, my age, there's, there's a lot of life left, right? You don't have to settle and you don't have to, if you're over 40, man, you still got plenty of juice left in you, right? Probably not even halfway there. We're designed to go 120 years. Yeah. I mean, 40 is like, it's a fraction. Like you're, you're a, a spring chicken question. practically. Yeah. So yeah. I think the biggest takeaways that people should take from this is number one, Train for gains and not for pain, right? I just had to come up with something that rhymed. I think that That's does awesome. the trick. Um, and that if you are in pain, obviously see a pain specialist, but also know that you can get back to learning how to move in ways that uh, are not going to cause you pain anymore, but you have to learn, number one, how to, uh, how to modulate your training for yourself using rate of perceived exertion, and, uh, and other things like that rep speed, like some things that you can look at and you, you can qualitatively say, okay, this is changing. 
So I'm going to divert the path a little bit. And I think the most important thing is knowing that it is a, a privilege to be able to train and really a gift to be able to be there for your loved ones. And as you get older, uh, you don't, you don't want to sacrifice any of that, right. whether it's in time or in, you know, uh, experiences, meaning I can't play catch with my kid because my shoulder's jacked up or whatever. Yeah. You know, uh, I, would, I would, if you don't mind me adding, I would almost go as far as the saying, no, I wouldn't almost, I would go as far as saying it's a responsibility. And uh, I remember having a conversation with myself. It was uh, 11 years ago, September, 2010. I was at the Pavel Dan John easy strength seminar. Mm. And the weekend before I had just taught an RKC and I, what was I doing? I had just, I came into town, right? Philly, two weekends in a row. I was sleep deprived. I drove up, I get off the plane in Philly. I get in the car. I hit the Philly turnpike or the Penn, Penn turnpike to get on the Jersey turnpike, whatever. And I reach across in the passenger seat to get a map. And I feel a pop, pop in my low back. And I just think to myself, oh, it's probably just readjusting. And this was um, when we were really testing out original strength pretty hard. So we started uh, original strength was becoming bulletproof at that time, back in April, 2010, April, May, 2010. So this is September, 2010, I'm feeling pretty good. I'm training for Olympic lifting. I'm like, yeah, I'm getting back into it, man. This is my year. I'm going to go to, I'm going to train, go to nationals next year. I'm going to win. I just got this gold medal mentality. Get the pop. I'm like, yeah, it's probably just from sitting couple minutes, probably about 30 minutes later, I'm like, man, my left, my left hip is getting really sore. And I got that weird kind of heat and pain across my lower back. And long story short, pull up to my coach's place in, in uh, North Jersey. And I can barely put any weight on my left leg. Thinking, oh man, this is terrible. Fast forward a day, I'm at uh, the Dan John seminar and I'm lying on the floor. I've got my weightlifting shoes on. I'm trying to warm up and loosen up because I got to go demonstrate squats for Marty Gallagher. And in that moment, my wife was three months pregnant with my son. And I thought, you know what? This is just absolutely stupid. Like nobody cares how much I snatch, how much I clean and jerk, whether I got the gold medal or no medal. The only thing that matters is that little boy. And I am, I'll be damned. Sorry, there's my R rated. <laughs> my PG. But this is exactly what I'm saying to myself. I'll be damned if I'm going to steal my, you know, his childhood from him because I can't move because daddy hurt himself and can't throw the football. And I had visions of um, him talking to his friends, doing his sports, and they go, where's your dad? He's over there. Or who's that old guy over there? Is that your grandpa? No, that's my dad. You know, being like a shriveled, withered up old guy because I hurt myself. And I was like, I'm not going to steal from my son's childhood, right? So, you know, we're, we're designed to keep going. But if you mess things up, there's a pretty good chance you won't be able to keep going. So, yeah, you know, brain smart, have a good reason why. So he, my kids are my reason why I don't do stupid things anymore. I think that's a good enough reason for anybody not to do stupid stuff. You know, <laughs> you don't have to. You definitely don't want your kids replicating it. And you sure yeah. as heck want to be there for them. So, yeah. uh yeah, that's a perfect reason. Uh, where can people find you? I know you've got an email list, for example. Uh, where can people go to get on that list, uh, follow you online, all that other good stuff? Yeah, I'm, I'm appalled to say I'm a I must be a terrible marketer because I don't have a general get on my list page. So maybe I need to put one up. You can uh, just email me, support at chasingstrength.com and say, please put me on your list. I want to receive your emails or whatever. Or you can you might be able to find something on chasingstrength.com or mm -hmm. you can go to my YouTube channel. I give away some, some videos there. You can probably get on my list from there. It's just Jeff Newport, YouTube slash Jeff Newport. Excellent. Well, I have to say, it's always good to see your emails in my inbox. I mean, I remember, you know, in my early days as a, as a kettlebell instructor, I was used to look forward to that daily email and you too, folks, you too can relive my glory days of reading <laughs> Jeff's emails by emailing him at support at chasingstrength.com or scour the world wide webs. YouTubes. See, yeah, the YouTubes and see what you can find. But uh, support at uh, chasingstrength.com. Get on his email list. Uh, soak up his wisdom as you have in this show, which was filled with tasty nuggets of knowledge. 
And uh, I hope to have you on again soon. Hopefully it won't take another year <laughs> like our previous yeah. discussions. As long, as no done, man. as long as it gets done, right? Exactly. Exactly. Uh, so thank you for being here, Jeff. My pleasure. Thank you, Alex. And folks, as always, have fun and happy training.